In today's episode, we have Mark Sham in the studio. You know, by the numbers, it's never been a better time to be alive in this world. But at the same time, it's also never been a more complex time to be alive. And I don't think we were prepared or taught to deal with the complexity that we face as humans today. Mark is a entrepreneur. He is a businessman, the owner of various businesses, including The Trust, Suits and Sneakers. Education for adults would become this blend of formal and informal education coming together. A lot like wearing a suit with sneakers. The YouTube and podcast channel Like a Tourist. Like a Tourist is probably one of the best forms of advertising for The Trust, because you can tell people that you make videos or you can show them. Among other things. And then you'll understand my whole happiness talk in the blink. It's not in the knowing, it's in the doing. Mark is a happiness expert, a public speaker, a world traveler, a all-round impressive guy. South Africa is a marvelous place. We have our problems. It just depends on what you value. Yeah. I value what we've got. You're listening to Intentionality with Paul Kemp. I am incredibly privileged um, to have with me as a guest for today's interview, my very first celebrity. And let me immediately start with a disclaimer there. I am a little bit starstruck here. Um, so let's uh, welcome to IWPK today, Mark Sham. <laughs> Hi, Mark. What an intro. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I've uh, put some pressure on you. We need to try and have some fun with that kind of intro. Yes. No, no. I'm, I'm like Fanta. The fun finds me. So we're good. We're good. <laughs> okay. I love it. Um, Mark, I think a good starting point for us today is just maybe to talk about how we met. Uh, I met you at the Trist. Uh, I was uh, attending an event there uh, with a mutual friend of ours, Francois de Vette, who's also been on the podcast in the past. And um, I was blown away, not just by the venue you've created there, but also your stage presence, the way you spoke, um, and the message also that you had at that uh, event that I attended. Tell me a little bit more about the Trist and what you do there. I want to take you back to the idea of celebrity. Mm. I'm definitely not a celebrity. <laughs> you are for me. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll go with it, but uh, definitely not intentional on my end, uh, on that end. The Trist is a COVID success story, really, because I was running another business called Suits and Sneakers, which we still have to this day. Mm. But when the pandemic hit, we couldn't host in-person events. And I'm proud of the story now. In the moment, it didn't feel so much fun. But as the pandemic hit, I ran my first webinar with my laptop. It was terrible. Even I couldn't watch it back. <laughs> and so I immediately knew we had to up the production quality. I moved to get hold of two old school broadcast cameras like a week into the pandemic. And I was pretty much the first person I knew of that did that. So as soon as I put my first webinar out with this two camera setup, kind of like what we're using today, though you got three. Uh, some old clients, marketing clients, called me up and said, I saw what you did with your webinar. Could you do that for us? Now, cast your mind back to um, March, end of March, beginning of April 2020. We have no clue how long this is going to be, you know, what the stakes are. So I was like, you're not getting income coming in from here. Just follow the money, so to speak. And so we started helping other companies with their webinars or whatever online setups they had. Two old school cameras turned to three, turned to WeWork. And about six months in, the business is now kind of like stabilized. Great. But the problem that I'm having is that I can't um, I can't customize the space that we work exactly the way I want. So I'm looking for a space that's about 100 or 200 square meters. I'm looking on Property24 and lo and behold, I find a building that's about 1,500 square meters. And that should be your first sign that I... Uh, I'm not so good at math. I went to the building anyway. <laughs> yeah. I had a look, but as I walked into the building, I knew we were onto something because of the tall ceiling, just the way it was set up. It was an old gym inside of an office park. So long story short, I made a cheeky offer to the, the owner of the building. They accepted. And we just kind of figured our way through to now what you refer to as the Trist, a 250-seater hybrid conference venue in Joburg would need to be precise with two video studios and a team just doing some cool things. But it was never the plan mm. at ever to have become a, an eventing space owner. Oh, but it worked out. I mean, I've been there more than once and it's, it's an incredible venue and we've had some really good events that I've attended there. I think the secret there simply is that we have become our own customer. So of course we rent the space out to corporates and what have you. But it was actually the secret sauce that was missing from Suits and Sneakers. You have your own venue to host your own events. 
what would you do if you had a space like that on tap? And so I think those are the events that you would have attended. And I'm really, it's really nice to hear you say that because that was how the name came about. We wanted to create events with love, passion, romance, never just run a run of a mill event. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, just before we go on, there's something you said, which I absolutely love now. I just want to quickly go back to it. My first 10 episodes of this podcast, no doubt about it, cringeworthy. Any time I have to go back and look for something in one of those episodes, I hate looking at myself and how we did there. Uh, and I'm so glad to hear that you had that same experience with your first thing that you did. I think we should wear those early moments with pride. There's that quote that I'm going to butcher, but it goes something to the effect of embarrassment is the price that you pay for, you know, upskilling yourself or, or figuring out new things and getting better. So you have to learn to suck. Uh, when doing something new and you have to be okay with it. And I think that's one of the reasons why entrepreneurship isn't for everybody or side hustles aren't for everyone because Absolutely, you have yeah, to suck. Yeah. And it's it's quite hard to, especially if you are successful in other areas and then you have to kind of lower yourself, quote unquote, to do something amazing that you put out to the public and it's not great at first. I love that quote. Uh, I'm going to do it a bit differently. And it's not a quote. It's just a, a, an idea of mine. I think embarrassment is the price you pay for getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, and the moment you get out of your comfort zone is the moment you start growing. So we've spoken about the twist. Um, you've mentioned suits and sneakers. I've did, I have did a bit of research on you. There's a lot of things that you do. I'm kind of still struggling to figure out exactly who it is you are and what it is that you do. Um, tell me about bit more about some of the other things you do, like suits and sneakers. Well, there's actually, it's, it's just happened that way. And what a lot of people don't realize is that because we have these different brand names all over the show, it looks like we do different things, but there's actually quite a golden thread that weaves between the lot. So suits and sneakers is, I guess the best way to describe it is it's a social learning club for adults. It's, it comes from the fact that when I was 17, I got kicked out of school I thought I was going to go to varsity in the US. And then when I got kicked out, I kind of got pushed indirectly into entrepreneurship. So with no formal education, how do you upskill yourself in the world? And as fate would have it, I was born in the era of the internet where you can actually learn almost anything, anywhere, anytime at virtually no cost. What you're effectively putting together here today is in hope and in lieu of helping someone learn something new. So I was born in the era of the internet and I learned about the world informally. Somewhere along the line, I became a public speaker by accident, which is a story for another day. And I started to realize that I was getting paid an enormous sum of money, oftentimes more in an hour than most people earned in a month. But I'm mentioning it for a very specific reason, because I also wouldn't, so these companies were paying me to speak at their event. I also wouldn't be able to get through the front desk for an interview. Think about that dichotomy. They come to me paying me this money, but you could never get a job there. Yeah. And that's just quite funny to me. And it showed me that I thought the future of education for adults would become this blend of formal and informal education coming together, a lot like wearing a suit with sneakers. Mm -hmm. So I wanted that visual to kind of be burnt in people's brains when they came to the event. Now, there's enough formal educational institutions around the country and around the world. So we wanted to focus on the informal topics where you don't get a degree or a certificate at the end, but it's no less valuable. And... That's what we've been doing for the last nine years. Like I mentioned, the trust came about uh, as a result of not being able to run Suits and Sneakers, but now Suits and Sneakers has a home. We can run our own events anytime, anywhere, and um, we get to create an enormous amount of content because of the video studios at the trust. So Suits and Sneakers and the trust have meld together. By the way, Suits and Sneakers is single-handedly the greatest form of marketing for the trust because when people come to events like you did, I don't have to shout about the venue. They in the event, seeing how it all works, almost always we get a phone call afterwards saying, could we use the venue? Yeah. And so we do. The third brand we have is called Like a Tourist, and that is my YouTube channel dedicated toward South African tourism. I'm just trying to create content that inspires more people to act like tourists in this beautiful country of ours. <clears throat> and it came about because, again, in the midst of COVID, they kept going, you're on, you're off. You can close, you can open. And so now I have some staff and we can't do anything in those times, but we can travel a little bit. So then I just thought to myself, every time I came back from an amazing part of the country, I would blurt to people like you, like, I went to this amazing place called New Bethesda. It's incredible. And then you'd be like, yeah, cool story, bro. And I realized I had to show you, not tell you. And as soon as I started making those videos, 
uh, about like a tourist and about the country, um, people would say to me, oh, I just went to the place that you showed. But what's super interesting about it in the background is like a tourist is probably one of the best forms of advertising for the trust because you can tell people that you make videos or you can show them. I can't tell you how many clients just call me and say, I watched your like a tourist video. Would you do a, a video for us? I don't have to have a briefing about what our skill set is. Are we good enough? I don't know if I fight on price. That's what like a tourist did. Um, and then there's a few other things, but the point being is that they all kind of connect into each other. They're just sub brands under one business. Okay, I'm going to be like all those other people who've watched your videos. I'm going to be exactly like that. So you did a video um, where you traveled from Joburg and your first stop was at the Kharib Dam and you stopped at New Bethesda as well. I've been to the Kharib Dam a number of times, um, but never on that dam wall. Oh, wow. And when I saw that video, I said, I've got to go and do that. So August this year, driving through Kharib, I went for a run on that dam wall. It was amazing to see. I cannot believe that that damn wall is exactly as old as I am. It was built in the year I was born. And in 52 years, I've never been on that damn wall. How crazy is that? But you inspired me to do that. And as we came back from that trip, um, we booked a place in New Bethesda and we spent the evening in New Bethesda and it was amazing. Loved it. You inspired that trip. Well, I get, I get some cold chills thinking about it because... Mm -hmm. That was the ultimate aim of like a tourist. We still haven't officially monetized it. And I don't really care, to be fair. Um, I wanted people to understand how beautiful this country was. Mm -hmm. And I just know that if you show people, you've got a much better chance of getting them to visit than if you tell them. Yeah. I think there's a broader mentality that's broken in South Africa about how we view travel. We think of travel as only taking place when we leave our borders. Now, I've traveled all over the world. I partially moved between Europe and South Africa. Uh, because my partner is Swiss South African or South African Swiss, depending on whichever way you want to look at it. Yeah. So we spend an enormous amount of time that side of the world. And I love it. Don't mm. get me wrong. I love it. <clears throat> but I think that we underplay how incredible South Africa is. We also forget how many foreigners spend thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to come and visit the places that we don't. And then finally, I have to just add that the soul of South Africa, in my opinion, resides in small towns across South Africa. And that's when you ever go to those places, you understand it. And so I just think my job is to show people what they're missing out on. And hopefully the video and the quality of the production inspires them to go see those places. And then think about the knock-on impact of the economy. People spending more money going to these small towns. And it's just magical. So when you say that to me, that was, the, that was by design. And it's just lovely to hear that that was the case. And it worked. You're doing a great job. Uh, I mean, I'm sure... It I'm not the only one that's been inspired to follow you in your like a tourist footsteps. And the nice thing that I'm finding traveling throughout South Africa at the moment, because I do travel a lot as well, unfortunately more for work than leisure, but still it's traveling. The tourists are coming back. Um, everywhere we go, especially if you go to the Western Cape, it's as if the tourists are really, really back. Um, and it just confirms what a great country we have. Well, I look at the, the statistics because I'm kind of involved in the travel industry informally. There's no question that um, the Western Cape has never had a higher number of people visiting. But I'm trying to get across to locals and foreigners that there's more to South Africa than Cape Town and the Kruger. True. Now, keep in mind that I live between Joburg and Cape Town, originally from Joburg and moved to Cape Town. I love it there. But there's more to South Africa than Cape Town, as magnificent as it is. And although I get why people want to go to the Kruger when they come from abroad, they should also do some other spots too. Because just down the drag from the Kruger is the Blyde River Canyon and that whole panorama route. And it is magnificent. And it to me, it's something completely different. And that's what makes South Africa so incredible. It's just the sheer diversity, not just of its people, but of all the things that you can do from a tourism perspective. I mean, through Like a Tourist, I have come to understand, and I've traveled a lot, there's more than I ever realized. And I haven't been everywhere. So still, without doubt, once or twice a year, I go somewhere and I'm like, oh my God, how am I only finding out about this now? Um, but it's a mentality. We don't actually realize that despite the problems we face in South Africa, we've actually got it pretty good in South Africa. The, the rest of the world's in a bit of a weird spot itself. But again, a podcast for another time. No, very true. I think last thing I want to touch on on this topic is I love it when I speak to people like yourself who have the opportunity to live overseas. I mean, your wife is, as you said, Swiss South African. You do live overseas a uh, certain time of the year, but you always come back. 
we still have our home here. You still enjoy it here. And that part I really love, uh, especially when you're talking to the, the naysayers, the people that have immigrated, that have left the country because they say there's no hope. I love hearing stories like yours. I lived in London for two years before coming back to South Africa because of the pandemic. And then I've been between South Africa and Switzerland. I love Europe. I love the US. I don't think that people realize that leaving home, moving to a foreign country is a trade-off. Huge trade-offs. What's happened in the past when South Africa was particularly going through a gloomy patch is that people would be so frustrated with what's going on here that they think the other side is just automatically better in every regard. But they don't realize that they're giving up some stuff and they're gaining some stuff. And so depending on what it is that you value will determine if you have a really great experience on the other side of the world or not. And what I found out from London and Switzerland is how many South Africans have moved for whatever reason. And by the way, not everybody leaves South Africa because they hate South Africa. A lot of people leave for other opportunities. This is no different to the rest of the world. London is a global city filled with a lot of people who come in from other parts of the world. So I don't know why we think of people who leave South Africa as bad. They're not. But even for the people who have left for bad reason, something bad happened to them, they often miscalculate the good that they're also giving up. And once the newness of the new country that they've moved to wears off, they really start to go, oh my goodness, yes, we had our problems here, but South Africans are so friendly. They'll just talk to you in the lift or the elevator or they'll, they'll just say, how's it but as they run past you? And there's a certain air of coldness in Europe that doesn't resonate for me. Or we have the most magnificent weather or the cost of living is actually pretty decent here compared to what's happening overseas. And I can go on and on and on. South Africa is a marvelous place. We have our problems. It just depends on what you value. I value what we've got. And so while I will always enjoy traveling abroad, and South Africa is a special place, I, I much rather want to be part of the, the change. Mm, mm. Um, it would take civil war for me to leave, I think. Yeah. I love it. I love the way you look at it. The one thing you mentioned that I fully agree with is the people. Um, I've been to many countries in um, Europe as well. Love it there. Love traveling there. But I always find the people a little bit rude. I don't think they're necessarily rude. It's just so different from South Africa. Yes. When you go to a restaurant there and you, you get a waiter, getting that waiter to smile at you, to be friendly, to anything like that is rare. Yeah. Here in South Africa, it's, it's, the exception is the rude waiter. The exception is the waiter that's not smiling at you, that's not friendly. And I love that difference about South Africa. There's no question to your point that we have an incredible warmth, our people. Mm. And I, I want to kind of reiterate what you said. I don't think the people in Europe are rude. They're just brought up differently. They the have they a different are. demeanor mm. and structure. I certainly know that in very well-developed first world cities that are densely populated, you're over people. Like even I learned getting onto the uh, underground in London at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Do that for a week and you've got some guy's armpit in your face and you're <laughs> over people. Yeah. You don't want to see people and talk to people. Um, but even beyond that, we do just have a warmth that I think is renowned around the world. And when you don't have it for a while, you miss it. Yeah. You know, we were away for three months of this year. I missed it. When we got back, I was like, oh, thank God. Thank you. Someone's smiling. And But you get other things that are valuable there too. So that's why I don't think it's ever great to compare. It's just trade-offs. And depending on what you love will depend on what you, the kind of experience that you enjoy there or here. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, the FFG Group of Companies. Take another step into living a more intentional life by being more intentional with your finances and insurance. As a trusted provider of a wide range of financial services, the FFG Group offers innovative, tailored solutions that help companies and individuals thrive and flourish. They are an amazing company that I believe in because they embody intentionality in everything they do. And I'm proud to partner with them. FFG is an authorized financial services provider Ready to take the next step? Click the link below and start making better, more intentional financial decisions or visit their website. Remember, with FFG, you create the memories, we ensure the journey. I do want to tell you a story and then maybe we can move off this topic onto the next topic. Uh, we were in Greece a few years ago. Loved it. I think Greece is one of the best places in Europe to visit. And I think the second or third day we're in Greece. We're in a restaurant. My wife wants to order some wine. Um, but she's having difficulty understanding what's good and what is it that she would enjoy. So she keeps on asking questions to the waiter. And it's the one question after another. I can see this guy's really 
losing his patience <laughs> with her here. And at one stage, when she asks the next question, he says to her, very rude, he says, it's Greek, it's good, you want it or not? <laughs> and that's, that's, I think, kind of sums up the way it's there. <laughs> I um, also love people like that. You know what I mean? But, no, I agree. But yeah, I agree, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, um, uh, Let's maybe move on to another topic. But it means moving back to the trust and to a event you had there, um, which I particularly loved. You did something called the Happiness Workshop, and I think it takes back to that informal training or informal education that you spoke about. I mean, you did a workshop on happiness. I've done an episode on happiness, episode fifteen of IWPK. I spoke about the difference between happiness, joy, and bliss. I think that episode's got 100 views or something like that. Um, but uh, you did a happiness workshop, and it really resonated with me, some of the things you shared in that workshop. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you decided to do that and how it was, um, uh, how it happened. Sure, it's such a broad topic, but I mean, Think about what the schooling system is meant to do. It's meant to help young people acquire skills to thrive in a future time. And if you look at the world that we're living in today compared to the world that we, our parents or our grandparents were living in 50 or 100 years ago, it's so dramatically different. But the schooling system has really marginally iterated itself over time. So there was a specific moment in 2019 where I heard a statistic about um, the life expectancy in America going down three years in a row. And something that really caught my attention was that car accidents got overtaken at the time by drug and opioid abuse and suicide. And you suddenly think to yourself, in a way, we live in the best time known to man. You know, by the numbers, it's never been a better time to be alive in this world. But at the same time, it's also never been a more complex time to be alive. And I don't think we were prepared or taught to deal with the complexity that we face as hum humans today. Now, if you were lucky enough to get a really good upbringing from your parents, you are most likely better suited or better prepared for this chaotic world. But you can't rely on that anymore. If you look at the number of single parent homes, if you just look at where the world's at, a lot of people aren't getting taught from young. They don't have these mentors. They don't have these guiding lights. And so you can see that people are all over the show, uh, evidenced by the number of people literally pulling the plug on their own lives. So it was a topic that I was thinking about for quite some time over the years, but then a personal incident happened in my own life, which really caused me to reflect. And in doing so, I decided that the best way I was going to learn about the topic is to teach it. Um, and I always put that out there to people. I'm no happiness guru. I didn't study psychology. I want to share a subjective one-on-one -on -one take on what I think I've learned. But the first time I ever presented it, it was so popular. I immediately got phone calls from people asking me to come present it at their office which is ironic because that wasn't the aim. I just wanted to share what I had learned over that or what I had like researched and put together over six, seven weeks. And so the happiness talk took on a life of its own. But really it comes down to this idea that I've just turned 40 and if you look back at, if I look back at the instances in my life where I was successful, if I delve further as to what caused some of that success, it definitely wasn't Pythagoras or math or English. You know, that none of that really helped me during COVID when I had no clue what to do to earn a living. It was almost like the government of the time said, yes, we're going to tie your arms behind your back. We're going to wish you good luck, but you can't do what you used to do. Go well. Now, no formal education can prepare you for that. No manual can prepare you for that. So I wanted to kind of teach people what I had learned there. And it's taken, in fact, ironically, straight off this interview, I'm doing that uh, event again tonight. The happiness isn't what you think. Talk. But really, it's just my guide for trying to define the idea that happiness isn't the feeling or the emotion to me. It's much more about learning to acquire the mental tools and the emotional infrastructure to deal with complexity. And here we are. This topic has blown up. And uh, obviously, it's an hour long at a minimum, so it's not worth getting into the depth of it. But it really focuses around the ideas of no one taught you how to be happy as a young person. No one taught you how to have a relationship with yourself or other people, and no one certainly taught you how to have a relationship with pain. And that's one thing you're guaranteed. If you try something new, if you experiment, whatever it is, you are bound to experience pain and failure. Uh, good people are going to hurt you. You're going to hurt other people even when you don't mean to. So there's no way to avoid hard, difficult, uncomfortable, pain, failure, making mistakes. No way. But what we tend to do as human beings is do anything to avoid it because we don't have a relationship with it. And then we do anything to numb it. And of 
all the things we don't appreciate that pain is the precursor for growth in your life. So it's this weird dichotomy of you're avoiding the very thing that makes you better, but it's Aina. Mm. And no one taught you how this process works. And hell, I have a lifetime of experience of doing anything to avoid feeling hard. So I guess in a nutshell, that's where that came from. And it's been, I always make a joke about the happiness talk. It's the most fun I can have with my clothing on. <laughs> because when people get it and they come to you afterwards and say, I really learned something. Thank you. And thank you for sharing it in this vulnerable, non-teachy way. I just really got value. So the best part is when people come to me two years later and go, I remember you said this thing. Mm. You know what some, you, you know what kind of impact something must have for people to remember specifics two years later? Um, that's, so it's not, the pride comes from having an impact, not how well known it is. And there we are. Oh, wow, that's incredible. Um, one of the things you spoke about at the happiness workshop was finding your ikigai. Yes. Or ikigai, I don't even know if ikigai. I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, you seem to have found your ikigai. Jeez, Paul at a cost, huh? eh? <laughs> Because I think what people tend to do is celebrate their victories and never their losses. You want to get into the world of entrepreneurship and small business, you are going to get clattered from morning to night. I am one of the few people who don't mind being honest about uh, the, the losses that we take. And I think it's important to share both. But the ikigai really is a concept of doing what you love, doing what you're good at, doing what the world needs, doing what the world is willing to pay for. And these are all critical junctures because at the intersection of all four points lies your ikigai. Now that's great to talk about in theory, but the truth is it takes years, if not sometimes decades to figure out what that ikigai is because you don't go to a workshop and someone gives you your ikigai in a nice, beautiful bow with a bow on top. Here you go and, and now go do it. You like a small, running a small business, you walk into life with an idea of what you think will make you happy or what you'll enjoy. You often walk into life with an idea of what people are willing to pay for. And then when you test it against the market, you find out that is not true at all. So it takes a while. It takes pain. It takes discomfort to figure out your ikigai. And why most people don't get there, I think, in part is because it's much easier to be swayed by the winds of life into a direction with very little direction. Uh, not that I'm, you know, mucking about with someone who becomes a vacuum cleaner salesman, but I don't think anybody's woken up to say that's what they want to do. And if you become the vacuum cleaner salesman and you love it, no problem. But what often happens is people fall into these positions in life where they're like, this is not what I want to do. This is not making me happy. This is, this is not, insert story here. But the pain cost of the pain that they have to pay to move from that to experimenting to get to that point is really difficult. So people pick safety over risk, but they ultimately pay, I think, the price of regret later. This sounds very philosophical, but you see it. Mm. And it happens to higher filling positions too. Like I have some mates who were effectively forced into becoming doctors or lawyers by their parents, and they gave into that pressure, which is easy to understand why they did. And now they're making more money than they ever have, and they hate their lives. So... I think I have found my ikigai. It's come with a lot of pain and it's come with a lot of um, sacrifice that you don't always speak about. Anytime you have your own business, it's like a double-edged sword. I get to do the stuff that I love. I get to impact the future. I get to create according to the vision I have in my head. But there's no such thing as a nine to five. It has an impact on your family. You know, my wife has to deal with work being a topic we speak about five o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And even if we make deals not to do it, since it's so all consuming, you kind of snap back into it. So there's a cost, but would I have it any other way? No, I think finding your ikigai is a, once you find it, it's joyful. It truly is. It's, it's the best feeling in the world, but it should just never be understated the cost that it comes with too. And the cost that comes with not finding it too. Thank you for sharing. I, I love this concept of Ikigai. Maybe if I can just briefly touch on it. Somewhere in this room, there's a book called Finding Your Ikigai. And I read it pretty recently and I was so impressed with it. it I literally started reading it, it the morning. You. Is it behind me? The light blue one behind yes, you. Yes, yes, that's right. I started reading it the morning and I was so completely engrossed in this book. I literally finished that book in one day. Yeah. And I've done an episode on it on the podcast. And the interesting thing for me is not just finding your Ikigai. Um, I think a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time, 
Um, a lot of effort goes into that. But what I found interesting is also how your ikigai can change. That's something that has happened to me. Uh, I'm privileged, I'm fortunate, I've reached a lot of success in business. Um, I'm CEO of the company that I work for. And um, at age 50, I started realizing that, yes, that was a wonderful reason for being, achieving success in business. But I think there's something more to it. And since then, I've been finding that that reason for being has changed. And it's also part of the reason for this podcast about making a difference in people's lives, having an impact on people's lives. Even if it's just one person somewhere listening to something you and I are talking about today, being inspired to change something, to be more intentional with their life, to improve their life, um, to reach their um, recipe for success or definition for success. Um, well, two things there. First, I want to commend you for the level of effort and time that you put into the podcast. Thank you. Um, you can't say that to your audience because it sounds like you're bragging. Or it could. <laughs> but I can say that I think that the level of time and effort uh, and attention that you and the team behind the scenes put into this is commendable. Thank you. But it shows that you're, this is a serious part of the difference that you want to make. So for those people, for those of you there that are watching, now you know. Uh, second of all, to your point that your ikigai, I think it can change because you are, as a human being, are changing constantly. And what mattered to me at 25 and 35 and now 40 is so dramatically different. So of course it would change. Also, sometimes you think you have an idea of what will make you happy, but then you find out through doing that actually that's not all it is, is meant to be or cut out to be. So I guess it is to a degree a, a moving thing. For me, as an example, I know that I really get the greatest joy out of uh, providing value for people in some way. I don't know if it's a if it's a good or bad thing in terms of where it comes from. You know, I had a weird upbringing as a youngster. So maybe it's a validation thing. I think it can be multiple things, but maybe it's also I genuinely get a kick out of helping people in some way. So the ikigai is not about how that happens. It's just um, what you're trying to do to begin with, help people. So whether that's through the happiness talk, whether it's through supporting small businesses or helping people educate themselves more broadly through suits and sneakers, whatever. I've found many different forms of getting to the central ikiga. And that's probably been the best move is to have a bit more fluidity around it. Fantastic. Um, Mark, we're getting uh, close to the end of this episode and we just need to maybe spend a moment on that word intentionality. It is, after all, the name of this podcast. Um, I've got this question I like asking all of my guests and I love the answers that I get because they're so different. Yes. Is there anything you do in your life intentionally on a daily basis, weekly basis that contributes to your success, that contributes to your happiness, uh, to your ikigai that you can think of, that you yeah. can share with us? I think there are three things mm -hmm. that just immediately pop to mind. So the first one is simple to talk about, harder to do. Ever since I was a kid, I just keep asking why long enough. And it can frustrate people, right? So let's say you and I are having a conversation about um, an idea that we have in a proposed way forward. And I keep saying, but what? And you'll make it, you'll make a certain statement as an, uh, the assumption is given as a fact. So like, no, you can't do this because of this. And I'll just go, but why? Like who made that story up? Why? Now, if you're with the right people, that's quite an interesting conversation to have. If you're with the wrong people, they'll be like, shut up. That's just the way it is. Or that's how we've always done it. Or you're like a six-year-old kid. <laughs> yes. But actually, that, that perpetual questioning of yeah. why, yeah. Or, or why does it work that way, that every day, I'll be thinking about a problem that I'm facing. I'll be thinking about a conundrum that I have, whatever. I keep saying to myself, but why, why, mm. why? And then you, you don't take anything as fact you're allowed to question right the way to the end. And when you do that, it's remarkable what happens because there's all these assumptions that have been made on your behalf that aren't actually true. And in 40 years, I've just learned that other people made these rules. I don't have to follow them. And by me not doing so, I've managed to achieve certain levels of success. So I think that that's one. The two, the second thing is I always spend a certain amount of time every single day watching YouTube. And you might think that this is frivolous, but I, I spend at least an hour a day. It's kind of like my switch off time to go and just flick through my algorithm, which right now is so attuned to me. And so I am learning about the world, things that impact me directly and things that impact me indirectly every single day for an hour. So the world would look at me and consider me to be uneducated because I don't have a matric certificate or a degree. 
But if you slightly shift your view of what education is, I think I'm one of the most educated people I know because I put in the time and I have found that investment of time to have such an impact on my life at every turn. And then I suppose if we're going to get, I don't mean to get cliched, but I think it matters that through the happiness talk that I teach, which is really me teaching myself to ingrain those things, I try to spend an enormous amount of time each day being grateful. But I want to be precise about that. Not feeling gratitude, because that goes nowhere. Practicing gratitude. So practicing gratitude to me is actively telling the people that you love, that you're grateful for them, and why. And you actually be surprised at how uncomfortable it is for you and them. But in other words, not waiting for something bad to happen or a big moment to occur for you to say, I love you. So an easy one is with my wife, my partner. We're not officially married yet. Let's call her my wife because she's my future baby <laughs> mama. But in that case, I tell her every day. I try to remind her. And so that's a practice that's come in now. And I have certain friends that I just really love. I don't always tell them every day, but I try to tell them often. You'd be surprised at what happens in your life when you actively practice the expression of gratitude on a daily basis, especially when people aren't looking for it or they don't know that it's coming. You want to talk about transforming your life because then you realize that everything in your life you get to versus you have to. And I'm going through the, the war at the moment because I've got this big suits and sneakers event coming up in a few weeks and business at the Trist is crazy and I'm trying to launch another brand and it's intense and it can overwhelm you. And so my point is, by trying to shift my brain toward, and I didn't come up with this, I read this somewhere, I get to do this versus I have to do this. And then practicing that gratitude. Now that may sound cliche to people, but I swear, I don't think happiness is in the knowing, I think it's in the doing. And those three things, amongst others, have just been so powerful in my life. Well, I, I think this is the best answer I've got to that question in 45 episodes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm, I'm going to express my gratitude to you, and that is that in, in the midst of this overwhelm that you're feeling with all of these things going on in your life, you've actually made time to come and sit down with this little podcast of ours. So I'm really, really grateful for you being here. Thank you, Mark. Now, I met your wife last week. I've got a task That's for right. you. That's right. I happened to just meet her at a conference. Yes. She came up to me and said, I'm Paul's <laughs> wife. And we got talking for two minutes. I would ask you to test this and then put it out on your podcast. Yeah. You take, you take about three minutes to close your eyes and just think about why, why you're grateful for your wife. And you do this over a patch of time. Then you take some time to write out everything that you're grateful for about your wife. And you do it in three ways. I, I'm grateful for what she does. This is how you feel when you do it. And you literally embody the feeling of it as you do, but you write it out. Mm. And then what you do is you call her at some point, and she told me that she doesn't always watch every episode because she doesn't have the time. So I got it on this, unless she watches this one. Then you take the letter and you you pick a call out one day or yeah. you tell her out of nowhere. And you just say, I just need to read this letter to you for five minutes and I don't want to reply. Now, because she's not expecting it, I want you to see how you feel after you do it. And I want you to report back on the podcast how it feels for her when you did this thing seemingly out of nowhere. And then you'll understand my whole happiness talk in the blink. It's not in the knowing, it's in the doing. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take you on on that challenge. But I do think that um, everybody listening, this is a challenge for everybody out there. Absolutely. I think it's a wonderful exercise. I can already see the kind of reaction it's going to elicit from her. Um, but yes, I think it's valuable and I think it's going to be amazing. I'm definitely taking you on on that challenge. And I know we're running out of time, so I don't want to go on, but you're just kind of impacting three centers of your brain. You're thinking about it. When you actually take the time, do nothing else. You put the phone aside, you close your eyes, you cut off all your senses, so you're thinking about it. And you're actually thinking about it in detail, three to five minutes. Then you're changing the brain center when you write. Then you're changing the brain center when you express it verbally. And doing all three of those things very intentionally, very powerful. You'll understand the neuroscience of it just by feeling it. Done. I'm definitely going to do that. Before we end off, I do want to go back to two things. Well, to one more. Th no, two things that you've said. So you've, you've shared the things you do intentionally. It's asking why. It's watching YouTube and this whole thing around gratitude, which you've explained now. Um, the second one, watching YouTube, I can relate. And I'm so glad that you've said this now. I sometimes feel guilty spending an hour on YouTube every single day. But for me, YouTube has become much more than entertainment. To me, it's not just education. It's about knowing what's going on in the world, 
obviously if you write, watch the right things. And then most importantly, it's probably between podcasts and YouTube, it's my number one source for the content and topics for my next episodes. Um, so I do spend at least an hour probably every day on YouTube as well. Um, glad to hear that I'm not the only one. And then finally, um, I think it relates to the third thing you said. What I've found since I've started this podcast last year is I've always been somebody that's been intentional. But doing the podcast has made me more intentional because I have to think about it every day. And the last thing I want to be is a hypocrite. And I want to tell people to be intentional and then I'm not intentional in everything I do. So it's kind of like doing these things with you with the happiness, expressing gratitude. By doing these things, telling people about it, talking to people about it, you doing it more yourself as well. Yeah. The power is in the doing, not the knowing. A lot of people come to my talk and they'll say, I knew all of this already. And I'm like that, well done to you. But the power is in the doing, not the yeah. knowing. And it's in the act of doing that you learn. So I don't think you can know your way to happiness. I don't think you can know your way to intentionality. I don't think you can know your way through awareness. I think you do those things. And I think in the world, we have a lot of people who sit on the couch and they know everything, but they do very little. I kind of refer to those people as consumers. I don't just mean in the typical definition of consumers, but consuming without doing means nothing. So it's like when people call a book their favorite, have you studied it a few times? Have you actually taken and thought about what you loved about that book and try to put it into practice? Mm. I, I'm with you. I don't think, I, the, I proudly wear the, the badge of spending an hour or more on YouTube every day. Um, it gets my brain moving. It's single, if you were to talk about the greatest contributor to my business success, mm. It's informal education, YouTube, books, podcasts. Since the world is forever changing, even if you got a degree 20 years ago, it's kind of irrelevant. Because, you know, Windows 95 was an incredible operating system 30 years ago, whatever, but it's not today. So it's like you, you need to continuously upgrade your mentality and your brain is like an app. And so the way I update it is YouTube, podcasts, and books, and it's changed my life. Mark, I think we can go on for another hour, but I have to respect your time as well. <laughs> uh, this has been incredible. We usually end off these episodes with a tip of the week or a recommendation. I feel like it's not even necessary because what you've shared so far is so valuable. But maybe as a final parting thought, just a quick recommendation of a book or podcast or something you've seen that you found valuable that you can share with the listeners and the viewers today. I want to give you two short uh, suggestions, depending on your mode. If you're a reader of books, there is a book called Soul for Happy by Mogadot, which I think is single-handedly the greatest book written about happiness and about life. Now, I'm biased for obvious reasons, but I'll tell you that book, I don't read it once or twice. I have read it five times. I got the course on it. It's just a guiding light for me. So there's one. That takes a little bit more time and effort. More recently, I watched an episode or a podcast or an interview between Simon Sinek and what's our famous comedian's name again? I can't remember. Uh, Trevor Noah. Trevor I Noah, thank that you. One. Yeah. I watched the episode or the interview yeah. between Simon Sinek and Trevor Noah, yeah. and the topic was about friendship. And I kind of watched it just because my, my wife said, give this a watch, and in turn as i did I, it blew my socks and it's only 20 minutes mm. so i would really recommend watching that because there was two things that came up in the last week where people said no one teaches you how to be a good friend and no one teaches you how to be a good business partner and i just thought wow like there's endless leadership books there's endless books for everything but not about friendship and happy and uh, partnership and i just thought that was so good so promise you it's probably super easy to go find right now on YouTube uh, the episode between Trevor Noah Simon Sinek wonderful production team uh, get that link uh, put it on uh, the socials for us uh, the book is going on my reading list it'll be one of the next books that I read uh, Mark this has been amazing thank you for being here thank you for sharing thank you for being vulnerable thank you for just everything you've done here today it has been absolutely awesome having you here and I really appreciate it and thank you for having me, but really thank you for doing the level of prep uh, that you do for these podcasts, because I think it makes a guest feel really welcome. And I just love seeing it. May this podcast live long and tall and wide. Thanks, Mark. That's it for today. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, see you again next week. Thanks for watching Intentionality with Paul Kemp. Subscribe 
like and click that bell to get notified when we release more episodes on how to live a life of intention and purpose.